Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Reading Zone Book Club. I'm very happy to have you here today and today we're going to be looking at Murder on the Safari Star by M.G. Leonard and Sam Sedgman, How to Be a Hero by Kat Weldon, Mort the Meek by Rachel Dallahay, and The Broken Leg of Doom by Palama Butchart. We're also going to have an appearance from Hannah Gold, author of The Last Bear, and Ross Welford, author of When We Got Lost in Dreamland, and he's going to be telling us about his secret talent. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Hello! Hi to everyone at the Reading Zone Book Club. Thank you so much for inviting me to come and speak to you. I'm going to tell you about my brand new Izzy book, which is the 10th Izzy book in the season. Now, before I reveal the title and the glorious front cover to you, I wonder if you've heard of any of my other books before. I'll give you a hint. They're all about school and things to do with school, like teachers and school dinners and demon dinner ladies, such as The Spy Who Loves School Dinners. My head teacher is a vampire rat. There's a yeti in the playground. <gasps> An attack of the demon dinner ladies. Dun, dun, dun. So I think you can see where I get my inspiration from. And I'm about to reveal the cover and the title of the latest book in the season, the 10th Izzy book. This is actually the first event I've done about the new book. So thank you very much to everyone in the book club for having me on. Drum roll, please. Dun, dun, dun. The Broken Leg of Doom. Dun, dun, dun. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about this one. I have never broken my leg like Maisie does. Look at her massive cast. <gasps> that totally looks doomed, doesn't it? I've never broken my arm or my leg, and I hope I never do. Have any of you? I did think that I'd broken my fifth metatarsal once when I used to teach in America. Your fifth metatarsal is your pinky toe, by the way, so it's probably the smallest bone in your whole body, but it was only bruised. It was only bruised. But Maisie's gone and broken her actual leg, and she's done it because she was doing some extreme dancing with Jodie. Now, I used to do a lot of extreme dancing when I was at primary school. Basically, extreme dancing is when you make a routine with your friends, and it's got to be quite adventurous and quite silly, and then you have to do it as fast as you can for as long as you can. And poor, poor Maisie, she does it a little bit too fast, and she has a little has a little fall. Now, when she goes into hospital, she's a little bit scared because she doesn't like hospitals, and Maisie's a little bit scared too. Uh, Izzy's a little bit scared too because she doesn't like hospitals either. However, it starts to get worse once they get there. You see, because there's weird noises that keep happening in the night, and she's not sure what they are. Kind of scratching sounds. And then when she wakes up, there are actually messages written on her cast. And she didn't write them, and Jodie didn't write them, and Izzy didn't write them, and Zach didn't write them. And then somebody keeps on moving her humpback whale called Francisco, which is her favourite, favourite, favourite toy ever. And then eventually, Francisco gets whale-napped. <gasps> and we don't know where he's gone, and the gang have to find out. And I, I don't want to give it away, but they might see somebody completely wrapped in... Dun, dun, dun. Now, I'm going to read you the very first chapter that's called Bad Things Always Happen in Threes. <gasps> Are you ready? Are your bottoms comfy? Deep breath. This is scary stuff. I knew something bad was going to happen as soon as we arrived at the hospital. And I knew it because my mum says that bad things always happen in threes. And two bad things had already happened that day because Jodie had made us all do extreme dancing, which is when you dance as fast as you can for as long as you can. And Maisie got dizzy and she fell down and broke her leg. And then we were in Jodie's mum's car following the ambulance to the hospital. I reached into my bag to get my Twix because I was starving after all the dancing, but it was gone. <gasps> And that's when I remembered I'd already eaten it on my way to school. So anyway, when we got to hospital, I got a weird feeling because it was there was a really creepy statue in the entrance and the weird shape of Maisie's leg was freaking me out. And also there was a strange boy with a feather in his hat, but it was when we found out about the curse that we knew. Maisie and her leg were in deep trouble. Dun, dun, dun. 
And there's some gorgeous illustrations in here by the illustrator, the amazing Thomas Flint, oh, my friend Tom. Look how cool that is. I think this might actually be my favourite cover. Every time Tom does a cover, I say, that's my favourite cover. And then I write a special message to him in the back of the book that says, Tom, this is my favourite cover. And I've had to write it in this one again because it is. It's very, very cool. Uh, I really like this one. I'll give you a sneak peek. This is when Maisie sees her broken leg for the first time. Da -da -da! It's so cool. Uh, sometimes people ask me, how do you come up with the ideas for Izzy and her friends? Uh, how do you make sure the, the next book is going to be different from the one before? Well, we're on book 10 and I think they're all quite different. They all kind of take place either in school or on a school trip or have something to do about school. And that's probably because I've never really left school. I went to, pri went to nursery school and then I went to primary school and then I went to secondary school and then I went to university, which is basically just a big school. And then I became a teacher. So now I've got all the inside information. I get to see all the weird things teachers do and write about them all the secrets in the book. Um, I've got a really good memory, I've got a really bad memory, but I've got a really good memory of when I was at primary school. So when I'm thinking of ideas for the next book, I kind of sit down and I think, right, primary two, primary two, what happened? Right, okay. Primary six, primary six, what happened? And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, oh God, do you remember the time we went on that bus and it smelled really, really weird? And then before I know it, I think, well, I, we never found out why the bus smelled weird, but I could just make up a reason now. What types of things would we have thought back then? And then I think, oh, Maybe something was on the bus with us and before I know, it just gets out of control. Like maybe your teacher comes into school with a tiny scratch on her finger and you say, oh miss, how did you get that? Because when she's handing your notebook, she sees a tiny scratch and she's a bit weird about it. She goes, oh, oh, I don't know, I don't know. And you think, how would you not know? It's right there on your finger. You must, you must know how you got a scratch on your finger. And then she goes back to her desk and you're supposed to be concentrating on your work. But all you can think about is, how did she get a scratch on her finger? Why would she want to hide it? And then you realise, oh, Oh my goodness, she's hiding a werewolf in her basement. So you tell all your friends and you're all starting to panic and cry. And then, because you're scared that she might bring it to school. And then you realise, wait a minute, maybe she is the werewolf. <gasps> and your teacher's a werewolf and it's all panic until the school bell goes for lunch. You go to lunch, there's been more panic because they're serving smelly shepherd's pie. I just basically got all my ideas remembering all the wild and weird and wonderful stuff that happened. <laughs> when I was at primary school and you should give it a go. You should think about something that happened one day when you were at school or at home that was only a small thing and then try to think about something and kind of an explanation that's wild that you could add on to that and then add on to that. And sometimes you can do it with friends. You can come up with an idea and then they can come up with an idea and before you know it, you've got a wild and weird and wonderful uh, book. Thank you very much for listening to me talk about my new Izzy book, The Broken Leg of Doom. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for having me in and have a good fun in your book club reading the book and talking about it and making up your own stories thank you very much i've been pamela butcher and you've been wonderful bye hi everyone i'm sam sedgman co-author of murder on the safari star and i'm here with reading zone to tell you all about writing adventure stories Murder on the Safari Star is part of a series of books called Adventures on Trains. They follow an 11-year-old boy called Hal and his uncle Nat, who is a travel writer. Each book is set on a different railway journey somewhere around the world, where Hal and Nat work together to solve a mystery. Murder on the Safari Star is set in South Africa, and while they are steaming through the savannah, one of the guests is found dead inside their locked compartment. There are three books in the series so far, and there are more to come, but they are all standalone adventures, which means that you can read them in any order. I write these books with a friend of mine, another author called M.G. Leonard. We split the work evenly, coming up with the plot and the characters together, and we both do all we can to make sure that the stories are as exciting as possible. I've got three tips for writing a great adventure story. First, have great locations. Adventures should always follow their characters through lots of different places that are all really interesting. Our books are set on trains, and that's really helpful because we can introduce new locations at each stop. In Murder on the Safari Star, we have nature reserves full of animals, a rooftop chase, and a huge waterfall. Great locations are essential. Second, keep the plot moving. Something should happen in every chapter of a story. You should find a new clue, make an important discovery, two characters should have a falling out. Something that changes the story should happen at every step. 
If nothing's happening, your story gets boring. So in every chapter, keep the plot moving. And lastly, build to a big climax. All the way through, it should be clear to the reader what the characters are trying to do. Stopping a villain, finding a missing jewel, or preventing an imminent disaster. It's like a promise to the reader that the adventure is going somewhere. A good climax delivers that promise. It should be bigger than the rest of the book and tie up all of the loose ends. Our books are mysteries, so the reader knows from the beginning that by the end, the mystery will be solved and all of the clues explained. We always try and do that in a big action sequence that's more exciting than anything else in the book. So, when readers get to the end, they feel that all of the chapters before it paid off. I'm going to read you a bit of Murder on the Safari Star to give you a taste of the adventure. This is from about halfway through the book, where Hal and his new friend Winston are trying to break into the compartment where the crime scene was to look for clues. The train is in a siding, and all the other passengers are away, finishing a safari, so they're by themselves. It's night time, and they're climbing onto the roof. They clambered up onto the observation car veranda. Winston shifted his rucksack from his chest to his back. Hal watched as his friend climbed onto the balcony railings, heaving himself up onto the roof, legs kicking. The wind ruffled Hal's shirt as he followed behind, rolling onto the rooftop, still warm from the evening sun. Come on, said Winston, keeping low and running softly over the top of the carriage. As they jumped the gap to the first sleeping car, there was a bright flash. Hal looked up. The red and smoky clouds in the distance were severed by hairline cracks of lightning, and a moment later, thunder rolled over the treetops. Rain's coming, Winston called out. Quick! He crouched down. Grab the mushroom vent with one hand and lower your legs over the edge. I'll hold your arms so you don't fall. Hal grabbed the vent on the top of the carriage and slid his legs over the edge. He felt a dart of fear, but Winston gripped his wrists firmly. His dangling legs found the open window, and he released one hand, grabbing the frame and pulling himself inside the compartment, falling to the floor in a heap. Winston came through the window behind him, landing on his feet with a wobble. We did it, he grinned at Hal. A flash of lightning lit up the compartment, and they both stopped smiling as they saw the empty compartment belonging to the dead man. Shut the blind. I'll turn that lamp on, Hal whispered. We don't want anyone to know we're here. So, that's Murder on the Safari Star and my three top tips for writing an adventure story. Use great locations, keep the plot moving, and build to a big climax. Do check out Murder on the Safari Star to see what I mean, and all of the adventures on Train's books. Our next book, Danger at Dead Man's Pass, is steaming into bookshops in September 2021. And if you enjoy adventures, I think you'll love it. Thanks to Reading Zone for having me, and thanks to you for listening. This is a story about a murder mystery on a train. It's set in Africa with lots of very interesting characters. The main character is a boy and his uncle. You follow them as they try to solve the case. I love this book because it was a real page turner for me. Um, I love the fact that the boy was the one that solved the case and that it's set in an exotic place. Hello to Reading Zone Book Club. My name is Hannah Gold and I am the author of this really beautiful looking book called The Last Bear. It's illustrated by Levi Pinfold and published by Harper Collins Children's Books and it is the story of my heart. So it's about 11 year old April who travels to the Arctic with her scientist father and when she's there she meets and then becomes best friends with a polar bear. When I decided to write a book about polar bears I obviously had to do lots of research and decide where am I going to set this book and that's when I found this real life island called Bear Island which is off the coast of Norway and somewhere between there and an archipelago of islands called Svalbard and I couldn't believe it. And then when I researched the island a little bit more, I discovered that even though polar bears used to go there a lot in winter, these days 
because the ice caps have been retreating so much in the Arctic region, the polar bears can't reach the island anymore. And once I found that out, there really was only one story to tell how 11 year old April rescues a lonely stranded polar bear a long way from home. I'm going to just going to read you a really short extract now and it's from the moment where April first meets Bear. And then the noise came again, much closer now. This time so fierce and loud and frightening, it sent a shiver down her spine. Even if she wanted to run away, she couldn't. Instead, she became rooted to the ground as every nerve in her body hummed and buzzed like electricity. It was as if time suddenly froze or at least slowed down. The air itself felt sharp and still. The wind stopped. Even the sea held its breath. And April knew if she looked up, her life would never be the same again that this moment was going to alter her in some way, maybe even forever. She slowly raised her eyes and there, standing on the other side of the beach, about 50 metres away, was the most magnificent creature she had ever seen. So I really love polar bears. So I thought it'd be really fun just to share three of my favorite polar bear facts with you. First of all, did you know their sense of smell is incredible. They can smell their prey up to 15 miles away. They mostly eat seals, by the way. They're also the largest carnivore on earth. But when they're born, they, they're as tiny as a guinea pig. And then my third and probably most favourite fact about them is that their fur isn't even white. In fact, it's translucent with this really hollow core. So when the light reflects off it, it just appears white, which I think is pretty sneaky. Now, this is a story of adventure and courage and of a little girl trying to fight back against a world which is changing fast. And I think there's a really important and powerful message in that. I know climate change can be scary, but together we can all make a better world. And just by doing one little thing each, we can all create a happier, healthier future, not just for us, but for the polar bears too. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm Ross Welford, and I'm the author of... This, this is my newest book. It's called When We Got Lost in Dreamland. And it tells the story of 12-year-old Melky and his annoying little brother, Seb, who become the owners of a Dreaminator. You can read more about it on the back there. Dreaminator is a little machine that you can hang above your bed and it will allow you to have any dream you want. Not only that, you can share your dreams with somebody else. Now, this is great fun for Melky and Seb at first, until things start to go wrong. It's full of adventure and humour, and I really hope you like it. But writing about dreams was a good opportunity for me to indulge in one of my fantasies, which is magic. Now, I've been involved in magic since I was very, very small. And if you come and see me live, or even on my virtual shows, I'll normally find a way of working in a magic trick. This is my secret talent. <laughs> and uh, it's not so secret, to be honest. But I thought I would try something with you today. This is the leftovers of my lunch. Now, I was in McDonald's earlier on and uh, I, I, I got a takeaway. And um, when I got it home, I realised that the man behind the counter had been having a bit of fun with me because I'd asked for extra ketchup. I didn't really expect the whole bottle. OK, but there is something that we can do with a little bit of magic. OK, I don't really want a whole bottle. So we'll try this, okay? Are we ready? A one, a two, a three. There we go. That will do. That's me. Goodbye. Hello, I'm Kat Weldon, and this is my book, How to Be a Hero. As you might be able to tell from the front cover, 
How to Be a Hero is set in and inspired by the world of Norse mythology. Now, when I say that to people, I generally get two reactions. Either people are really excited, they know exactly what I'm talking about and they want to find out more, or a look of sort of blank confusion passes over their faces because they just don't know what I mean. If you fall into the second group, don't worry, it's very simple. Norse mythology is the belief system followed by the Vikings and Anglo-Saxons over a thousand years ago. And if you're still not sure what I'm talking about, don't worry because you probably know more Norse mythology than you realise. Lots of it has trickled down to us over the last thousand years and we use it in our day-to-day -day language. For example, our days of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday are all named after Norse gods. And if you've ever watched the Avengers movies with Thor, Loki and Asgard, well, those all come from Norse mythology too. Some people even think that our idea of Father Christmas comes from Norse mythology. Let's think about that one for a second. Father Christmas is an old man with a long white beard who flies through the midwinter sky with magical animals, distributing presents out that are made by elves. Hmm, sounds like it could be Odin. That's why when I write to Father Christmas, I like to write, Dear Father Christmas, slash Odin, just to be on the safe side. When I started researching for How to Be a Hero, I was really interested in the idea of the nine worlds. You see, in Norse mythology, there isn't just one world, there are nine. Far up above us are the world of the gods, and deep, deep down below are the worlds of the dead. And all of these worlds are strung together in an enormous tree. There are also worlds full of giants, dwarves and elves all around us. This got me to thinking, if we're all in a giant tree, does that mean I might be able to climb out of my world, through the branches and into someone else's? And what would happen if I do? Hmm. But it wasn't just the nine worlds that I found really interesting. There are lots of other elements of Norse mythology. So in How to Be a Hero, we meet a magical talking treasure, a particularly naughty cup. That comes from Norse mythology. There is also a very scary dragon and a curse that needs to be broken. These are all things you can find in these old stories. I am fascinated by Norse mythology because it makes me feel connected with these people who lived so long ago and whose lives can feel so different and so remote to how we live now. When I read some of these stories, it makes these people suddenly seem much more human with the same problems and worries and ideas as I have. And sometimes the stories are also very funny. I hope that if you read How to Be a Hero, you might be inspired to go off and read some of these old stories yourselves to find out a bit more about some of these characters. And some of them have some very strange adventures indeed. Thank you. Bye. I would rate How to Be a Hero 5 out of 5. It's one of those comedic books and I really like them. Anybody who likes adventurous and comedic books, I think they'll like this book too. Brutalia is a welcoming place. <coughs> Brutalia is a friendly place. Actually, scrap that. Brutalia is scary and nasty and pretty flipping brutal. But a boy called Mort sees things differently. Mort! Mort doesn't believe in violence. So it's too bad that he's just been made the chief executioner. Will Mort the meek fight for peace? Or will he lose his head? Mort the Meek and the Raven's Revenge Mort! by Rachel Delahaye. Out now. Mort. Mort the Meek. I would rate it 5 out of 5. It was really funny because he is a pacifist and he has to kill his friend. 
It was a side-splittingly funny story and I would recommend it to comedy lovers and anyone who needs cheering up. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, learning so much about these wonderful new books, and I hope you enjoyed that little bit of magic in there. See you next time. Happy reading.